Well, welcome everyone to our webinar today on maximizing the benefits of curriculum aligned interim assessments. We're going to wait just a minute or two uh, to make sure that we give everyone the opportunity to get logged in. Uh, so stay tuned. If you are just now joining our webinar on maximizing the benefits of curriculum aligned interim assessments, we are waiting just a minute or two to make sure we can get everyone logged in and then we are going to start. So stay tuned. All right, so I think we can get started today. Um, welcome, welcome to our webinar on maximizing the benefits of curriculum aligned interim assessments. Um, we're excited to present these today with strategies for teachers and administrators because we know how important it is to make sure that your curriculum is aligned to the standards and then your assessments are aligned to the curriculum so you know how students are progressing. So our webinar today is designed to give you some tips and strategies on how to use curriculum aligned assessments. And with me today, I have Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Lynn. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Slover. I'm the CEO and founder of Centerpoint Education. And I started my career as a high school English teacher. And now I have launched Centerpoint to support educators and their support of student success. And it's really great to be here with you today, Lynn. Thanks for hosting. And I'm Lynn Gill. I'm the Director of Partnerships here at Kidham. We are partnering with Centerpoint in our platform in being able to offer interim aligned assessments to our curriculum. So it's great to be here today as partners to be able to share with you how the two work together. So today we're going to cover several topics. And while I'm going over these, uh, we have a short poll available that we would like for you to take to tell us which of these things are you most interested in today? So we have assessments aren't just for administrators and how every role within a school can use them to drive student success. The next option is we're going to talk about summative, formative, and interim assessments, the benefits of each and why you need them. Your third option that you can choose is maximizing the benefits of your assessments. If you've made the investment into them, well, let's look at how to extract the maximum return and all the different ways you can use your assessments. And then your last option is best practices when giving an assessment to ensure you get data that you can actually rely on. So I know that all of you are interested in all five of those options, but just choose one. And then I'm, we're gonna take a look at kind of where people's interest most lies. All right, so Zach, show us what the poll is. All right, so we have, most people are split between one and five. So why assessments aren't just for administrative purposes and how a school can use them to drive student success, and then how to drive real change using interim assessments. And you know, I'm not surprised that those are the choices that you have because having been um, a middle school and high school principal and then having been a director of curriculum at the district level, we give lots of assessments and we give those assessments with the idea that we're going to determine how successful our students are at mastering the standards. But when we go to analyze the data, a lot of times it's one assessment after another, whether it's a district assessment or your end of chapter assessment or your school assessment or your PLC assessment or your state assessment data. You know, we've got all these assessments. They end up looking like lots of numbers on a page, right? <laughs> lots of green, yellow, red, usually the colors we used and trying to group students that way. 
So there are effective ways to use assessments, and that's what we would like to talk about with you today. So if you take a look at the screen, you know, we have assessing students uh, to progress through the core curriculum in a way that helps us with our curriculum look at groups of standards together and how students are progressing through those. So far too often we think about assessments, you know, for administrative purposes. We look at it through the lens of, you know, how can we better understand how our school is doing? Are we going to meet standard with most of our students on the state assessment? Who do we need to put in our reading groups, right? So very few times do we kind of use our assessment data to say, you know, how do we measure and improve the curriculum effectiveness? How do we analyze our curriculum and our delivery of that curriculum to know whether or not it's the curriculum that is helping us be successful or we need to adjust our curriculum? You know, we don't do that very often, right? So what interim assessments allow us to do is take us take a look at state standards and take a look at the curriculum itself that we have aligned to the state standards and then say, you know, how is that curriculum doing? Do we need to adjust the curriculum in some way? Because if we take a minute to talk about identifying the gaps, right, and looking at where we're doing well, it's really important for us to focus on our contextual and experiential learning experiences for kids so that students with different and varying backgrounds can really see and understand within our classrooms how they are doing so that they can partner with us to improve their their standard, their standard mastery. You know, when I think about the work that I did um, with my schools, and I think about all the assessments that we gave, you know, we talked about, well, students didn't get it. So how are we going to remediate? Or these students did get it. Maybe we don't need to spend two weeks on the next standard. We can use that. We can spend five days and do something else. But I can't think of very often that we said, you know, did this curriculum help us teach students? Right. And so interim assessments, and I'm going to hand it over to Laura here, are what can help us really understand that. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Just a couple of points I'd make, um, particularly that on that last one. Assessments can help educators understand students' strengths and gaps um, so they can do their best work. And I think this is particularly on point right now, given that we're coming out of a pandemic with so many students who have missed so much learning. And as you said, assessments are part of the solution there. They can really help identify learning gaps so teachers and families can take the steps they need to address them. Um, but all assessments are not alike, as you were saying, and it's important to use the right assessments because if you're not using assessments that actually measure the content that you're teaching or you're using assessments that are not high quality or not well designed, you may actually be testing things that haven't been covered yet in the curriculum, and you might therefore see gaps uh, that actually aren't there while missing gaps that really are there. So getting the particular measure right matters. I agree with you on that. Um, and that, I think, is something that you know, we always have to create sometimes some of our own assessments. But if we can trust that there's an assessment <laughs> that is aligned, that we can look at that data and understand that that really measures what we want it to measure. I mean, that's what we're all looking for because we're trying to remove the work that, that, that is involved in the administrative tasks of getting it right to understand what we should teach. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, interim assessments, like just to ground people, inter interim assessments sit between the end of year test and the formative stuff that happens day to day. And they can be used throughout the school year, but they're not the smaller assessments that happen within the curriculum and within the classroom every day. Um, center points interims are given about three to four times a year, depending on the, on the subject and the, and the course. Um, and they provide information about progress towards those end of year goals, while also allowing immediate enough information so that educators can make just-in-time changes and adjustments to ensure those goals are met. Um, but again, it's, it matters what you are assessing and what assessments you're using. So um, we, we want to make sure those are aligned. If they're not aligned, the, what you're measuring is sort of this black box from this slide, I like this slide, versus a curriculum-aligned assessment that provides visibility into not just what is being measured, but how that aligns with what's being taught. 
Um, and just to repeat myself, when you're incorrectly aligned or poorly designed um, assessments are being used, they lead to incorrect data, missed insights, and ultimately really not just don't help, they can take teachers off their game and detract from their from their effectiveness. And furthermore, they're just not fair to students who are working hard to learn the content. So all that said, that's why um, we and I are a broken record on the importance of alignment um, to what students are actually learning when they're learning it. So that assessments can provide real-time information. Um, so let's take a look at this graphic. I love this graphic. This shows two different curriculum that cover the same content, but that are sequenced somewhat differently. Now, one is not better than the other. It's just that they have made different choices about how to sequence content. Um, and both of these curriculum are aligned to the underlying standards. Um, but the problem is that districts might just use an assessment that is aligned to the standards, but not aligned to either of these curriculum per se. I know this was true for me when I was an English teacher. The assessments were aligned at the standard level, but that may or may have not been consistent with what I was, with how I was teaching and what order I was teaching in. So if you use the same interim assessment to measure these two uh, curriculum, let's say looking particularly at unit four, you, you might not be measuring the content of unit four when the content is actually being taught. And that means that the data from those assessments could give you what we call false negatives, that students, they imply that students don't know something when in fact, they just haven't been taught it yet, for example, in one of them, or that they know it, but it's not being taught at the right moment, being, being measured at the right moment. And then you spend time trying to fix it and trying to figure it out when the real issues um, can get missed. So it's, it's, it is an issue that matters. It's pretty wonky, I know, but it's one of my favorite topics, so I'll keep going. It's also this issue of fairness. Again, if students haven't been taught, if they're getting tested on unit four, um, when they haven't learned unit four yet, um, it's not fair and it, and it creates disincentive and frustration. Yeah, you know, when I was a uh, curriculum director in a kind of a medium-sized district, we had about 70 schools. Um, you know, not every school used the same curriculum, not every school mm -hmm. used the same interim assessments, right? right? But we at the district level really wanted to give interim assessments because we wanted to be able to get groups of schools and feeder patterns together to understand how to support their students. And then we wanted to be able to send our instructional specialists out in targeted areas to support. So we would create our interim assessments, right? And um, one of the issues with that is that first of all, it's a ton of work to create interim assessments, right? And then we didn't want the schools to see them ahead of time because we didn't you know, want schools to inflate their numbers because they didn't wanna look bad in front of other pe people. Um, but, but some schools in order to get students to take it seriously because it didn't have anything to do with the curriculum they were learning, they would make it a grade, right? Oh and yeah, so that's tough, they were hoping that's awful. <laughs> they would make it easier. But then when we got the data back for those, we would end up with with all of these standards and then all of these standards that were read, right? Where, you know, a students not meeting standard in many of these areas. And people would get together. And, and this is the conversations I would hear from these groups of teachers. Well, we haven't taught that yet. Okay, well, maybe we can use this data to understand, you know, how much time we can spend on it if some of our kids got it. Well, none of our kids got it. Does that mean that we, we have to spend that time and well, our kids are all green. Yeah, well, we taught that unit too. And we found that it was not a very good predictor of how we could look at student proficiency and then adjust our interventions to meet those kids' needs to be able to work towards proficiency on the state test at the end of the year. I've have the, I'm on the board of a school here in Washington, DC where I live and I chair the school performance committee. And we've had this exact I've been on for three years and over the course of those three years, we've had that exact same discussion of this measure shows that we're doing poorly. But if you go underneath and you look at what the measure is actually uh, assessing and look at where we are in the curriculum, there's there's just a match. So all the worry that comes out, um, for example, to parents when they get score reports like that, uh, you know, 
really they're unwar- the worry is unwarranted at the moment because those content just haven't been taught yet. But the having that conversation really matters. I agree. So just to thank you for flipping this the slide. I mean, best practices around this, which we've kind of been talking about, are that anytime you're collecting and analyzing data, you want to make sure that the data are clean, so to speak, which means they have to be um, measuring what has been taught so that there's that coherence and alignment. There's this idea of consistency of administration. And I've been working in this space for a long time. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about our partnership with Kidum is that uh, schools can be giving the assessments to students in the same medium in which they're being given the curriculum. So it's not a stop and start feeling for kids. It's, oh, this is familiar. I'm already in there. I'm learning. I'm doing my curriculum work. And now I'm also doing my assessment. And it's the same look and feel. Um, so it feels authentic and um, and not uncomfortable for kids, but familiar. Um, and then the ability to easily analyze and visualize data, the data that come back, and thanks for putting this score report up, are already in the language that teachers are accustomed to with the classroom reports that they're familiar with. So the look and feel and the smoothness of the experience for them is, is a real plus. Yeah, I um in in most of my schools that I was that I was in as a principal, we did professional learning communities, PLCs. And so teachers, we would come together uh, once every two weeks, we would all give a common assessment and we'd bring all of our papers together, right? And people would write down on paper, you know, which kids did well and which kids didn't do well. And I thought to myself as I was doing this, I wish that there was just something that was easier. <laughs> right. <laughs> That my teachers could just bring their computers, open them up, and then we would be able to see together, let's look at this standard, or let's look at this question, right? Because the other piece of this is not just the standards in the curriculum, but it's also the way students um, understand the depth of the standard. So sometimes we would find that the multiple choice question we gave, they got. But then when we asked them for a short answer, they bombed it because they really hadn't fully understood the concept. And so when you're looking in KIDM, right, this is something that would have been easier for us to say instead of sorting our papers back and forth, right? Um, and for those of you that, that I know what you're thinking in your mind right now, you're thinking, but it's important students show their work. Totally agree with you. And they can show their work in KIDM. Yeah or they can show their work on paper. So that's my little bird walk there. However, back to my little topic, but if if we would have had this together, we would have been able to sort much easier to say, hey, let's look at it by standard. Oh, okay, let's see how these standards are. Oh, wait, let's look at it by question. Let's look and see how these students are doing. Is it, is it the way we are introducing the topic? Let's look back at the curriculum and what we did and see if that contributed to why students bombed this question. Because you can't just assume that they don't know it if it's not right, right? If, if they got the multiple choice right, but the short answer wrong, you don't know that they don't really know it. Maybe they can't articulate it. But if you have that data at your fingertips, you look back at the curriculum, you can say, oh, well, you know what? Look at how we talked about this. Look at the assignments that we gave that we gave students in KIDM to show their work throughout this. Now, wonder they didn't short answer. We didn't really talk about it in this way, right? And you can make those adjustments. And, and what's great about it is that it's not just having the data reports in front of you. I mean, that's the first thing. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. That's, that's a, a big point is the data reports easily sortable. But it's the what next that we're really talking about, right? We're not talking about the data. We're not talking about numbers. We're really talking about what can we do differently? And so that's where having it in KIDM is not just the data and sorting it and looking at it from different lenses, but it's being able to go back into the curriculum and then you can personalize the curriculum and you can customize the assignments. So when you take a look at this data, you could go back and say, you know what, let's create, let's customize this assignment. We notice that we need students to demonstrate their thinking more. So let's add a question that is a short answer question or a paragraph question, or let's add a question and have students show their thinking by recording a video or an audio, because we wanna hear them talk about this. And you can make those adjustments in the curriculum and then you can save it. So you always have the original version and then you have your personalized versions that you can share out 
with everyone um, on your PLC teams or throughout your schools. And so that's the other real powerful thing about this, which is what, what accurate data am I getting? And then how and what do I do next that makes my life easier so I can better teach students? Thank you for that. And you, you, that's like bringing back memories of the reams of paper that I would get after the free, you know, the in-room assessment when I was a teacher. And literally it was like, you know, six inches because there was one piece of paper about each item. <laughs> and, you know, what was I to do? A teacher with little time and, you know, not so much experience with all of that, all, that big stack and all of those data. It was very, it was very challenging. And the way that you've um, showed it there is just totally different. Different experience to be a teacher now than in the 90s. Oh, I just aged myself. Oh, well, that's okay. There you go. But well, Laura, we had a question in the chat that said, um, you know, I use illustrative mathematics. You say that your assessments are certified. What does that mean <laughs> to me using my certified version of illustrative mathematics? Because I know what the certified version of illustrative mathematics means. It means it's true to the author's intent. Right. And that means that also we're having author input for our professional learning and we're really delving into illustrative mathematics and the way that it was designed. But if you're also certified, can you tell us what that means? Absolutely. And if you will go to the next slide, I've actually got a slide that covers illustrative mathematics, which is one of the very specific curriculum that we have built assessments around to or aligned to. Um, so we've built the illustrative mathematics to match the scope and sequence of the curriculum and in the language of the curriculum. I think that's an important element. It's got to feel like it's part of learning. It's not a gotcha. It's part of what students have seen. Um, they will see questions that look familiar. They resemble what they've done in the classroom. And then the teachers will see data that connect to the content that they've been teaching. Um, which are, which is, you know, saves a lot of time. Think about my point I just made about the reams of data. Um, saves a lot of time and, and creates clarity. Um, and administrators can then compare results across schools within a district and across districts and states that are also using illustrative math. Regarding the questions about certification, we're super excited that the publisher, uh, excuse me, the author, sorry, the illustrative mathematics team, the author um, reviewed all of the assessments and um, has certified that they are in the look and feel matching the scope of sequence, high quality and aligned to the content. And we are, I believe the only assessment on the market that has had that rigorous review process with the illustrative mathematics authors. So um, there was a working, question. oh yeah, go ahead. I was to say there was another question that kind of oh. piggybacked on that. I see the questions, but I see where the questions are. Got it. Which was, um, why is there? Why is it just three to four times a year with an with the interim? How how does it kind of? How do you de how how did you determine how to kind of group them to have that three to four times a year for that guidance of those? And then you know, kind of how long do the assessments take, and what are they designed to do in a class period, or you know, how does that work? Yes, they're designed to be given in a class period. The idea is to minimize testing time, maximize information and utility, and to have kids really not feel like they are shifting from learning to test taking, but that it's all part of the same cycle. Um, the reason there are three or four, depending on the grade and depending on the, on the content, is that the curriculum itself has assessments embedded in it, and, which, and they're high quality assessments and, and we love them. And so we don't, we're not trying to replicate them or substitute for them. The uh, interim assessments sit a little bit higher above the curriculum and they bring together ideas that cross units. And then they also look forward to the end and um, kind of anticipate what's coming next and what do kids need to know and be able to do to be prepared for the end of the year. So they're not summative and they're not formative. They sit right in the middle. And so um, that is the kind of the, frequency at which the both our assessment team and the curriculum authors thought was the right kind of right sequence and frequency. And there were two more questions on this. Um, the first was, um, are there different versions? And so, you know, if, if 
we didn't want kids to cheat or we maybe needed to give a second version is are those in there and then the second question um, besides the versions were um, can you are there other formats they can be given in if we if kids can't do them on the computer how do you recommend that there are multiple versions of there are multiple forms of the of the same uh, you know, for example, interim A, there are multiple forms of inter interim A um, for the sake of making sure that the problem you just talked about doesn't happen. And th th we do have pencil and paper versions. I think most most people have shifted to giving curriculum, offering curriculum and providing access to assessments digitally, but we do have pencil and paper alternatives. Well, those were well, the only other question there was is, do we have to give everyone to get data or can we choose to give assessment two only at that time period of the year or assessment four only? Do we need to give all when, four? You know, thanks for that question. I think ideally people would give all of the assessments. They, they do follow the sequence of the curriculum. We have worked with districts um, where they've started maybe in the middle of the year. So they haven't given the early one. Montgomery County, Maryland comes to comes to mind. Um, their first year, they started in the middle of the year, so they gave the the mid year and the end of the spring interims and didn't give that first one, and they had data that was um, useful for them. Another district we're working with um, in Wisconsin has given all three of them, but has used them and you know disaggregated them and then also aggregated them for different slicing and dicing of the data. So I think the the beauty of them is that they're flexible. And you get the information back immediately, and you can use those data in all sorts of various ways. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but let me make another point. We don't, we don't, you, the district or the classroom is the one that turns on the access. So they are very flexible um, in terms of use and timing. We're not dictating the timing. The the school or district is deciding on the timing that works best for them. Okay. Well, I think that's a really important um, note because there are some assessments that aren't flexible on when you can give them. And if schools are trying to meet the needs of, let's say they've got dual language assessments and then they have literacy assessments and then they have end of chapter assessments and then they have the district assessments. <laughs> right. <laughs> I could go on and on, right? Like there's a there's a scheduling issue that happens with assessments. And it may be that because all of the assessments are happening at one time, they're gonna skip this one and go to the next one. Or it may be that if, because they can decide when to give it, they choose to give it on a week that, you know, there, there aren't all the other assessments going on. Exactly, right. You have to have the flexibility again, or it's not useful to you and it might not fit with your, your program and it might not be fair. So. All of these things are flexible. Well, Laura, we are coming up to the end of our short and sweet little time here with our group. I mean, you and I could probably talk about this forever. <laughs> Favorite topic. Yes, we could. They're our passion. Uh, but we'd really like to thank everybody today for attending our webinar. Um, assessments are near and dear to our heart because they're the way that we determine if our kids are being successful. And we want to bring kids out of our K-12 schools who are college and career ready for whatever they want to do. Um, and that means that we need to accurately assess them. And that is why Kidham has partnered with CenterPoint. It's why we value the fact that these assessments are certified and that we can tell you that you can trust the data uh, because you can trust the curriculums, right? We only have ed report green curriculums and I am as certified. Now you also know you can trust the data. Thanks, Lynn. It's been really fun to talk to you and I appreciate our partnership as well. And I'm looking forward to exciting things ahead. Have a great day, everyone.